Activist Radio is on the air. You have tuned into the Mark Harrington Show, sponsored by Created Equal. Mark is training a new generation of leaders to take on the culture of death and win. You don't like abortion, don't have one. The only thing that can be said to be objective truth is that there is no objective truth. It does come out in one piece. It comes out in one piece. I would argue that we certainly are not all created equal. And now, here's Mark. The question for the day. Can a Christian be an abortionist? Or I guess you could reverse that and ask the question, can an abortionist be a Christian? Can an abortionist, a person who dismembers preborn babies, be a follower of Jesus Christ? Uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Here on the Mark Harrington Show, your radio activist and voice of resistance coming to you live here on Facebook and all the other media platforms, uh, social media platforms uh, here every Thursday at 1 p.m., every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, you can tune in to the Mark Harrington Show, your radio activist, here on these social media platforms. So today, what I want to talk about is whether an abortionist will be a Christian or a Christian can be abortionist, however you want to put it. And the reason I bring this up is because there's been a book that's been released by an abortionist. His name is Willie Parker. Willie Parker. And this abortionist kills children in the state of Mississippi, in Jackson, Mississippi, at the pink house down there. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But he's released this book. And this book is called, quote, the, His life, Life's Work, or Life's Work, A Moral Case for Choice. A Moral Case for Choice. Willie Parker, abortionist out of Mississippi, has written this book, Life's Work, A Moral Case for Abortion. And if you don't know about this guy, you should. Uh, he's an African-American. He says he grew up in the South as a Baptist, in a Baptist church, as a fundamentalist. In other words, he, was, he went to a fundamentalist church, and for 12 years, he was an OBGYN. That means he just delivered babies. He didn't uh, kill children as an abortionist for 12 years because he felt it was wrong to do so. Well, I don't know what happened, and he's going to share about what happened, but he, he says that it was because of the speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who spoke about the Good Samaritan, and uh, that changed his mind, believe it or not, on whether he should give what he called abortion care to women. Now, just on the front side of this, let me, let me just say, just think about this for a second. Here's a man who is a mass murderer. Here's a man who is a serial killer of babies, and yet he can write a book about it. I mean, it just, it almost seems like we're living in another planet here. I mean, it's unbelievable. It would be like Adolf Hitler or any other uh, mass murderer who had uh, killed people on the level that we've seen in America, millions of them, uh, over 50 million since 1973, 2,900 a day, almost a million a year. And for the people that do to do the the people that do that 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 commit those murders write a book and that book's available to to be uh purchased online on Amazon i mean it's almost beyond belief right we're living in a culture where a man can kill babies and write about it and people will buy that book i mean just i just want you to get the context of what we're talking about my good friend Clinton Wilcox from Life Training Institute wrote the blog, and uh, go ahead and put that blog back up. Uh, and I want people, if you, if don't, by the way, don't buy the book, no matter what I say today, don't go out and buy this book by Willie Parker. First of all, we don't want to give him any money. Second of all, from what I can tell from Clinton Wilcox and his blog here, he says it's not worth reading, <laughs> number one. So, but you can read the blog, and so you can go to Life Training Institute's blog here. Let, read the uh, the uh, the summary, if you will, the the uh, of the of the book itself from Clinton Wilcox, and 
And what Clinton says generally in this blog, he says, first of all, uh, Willie Parker never makes a moral case for abortion. He, he never does. I mean, they, that's something that never happens in the book. And he never cites any of his facts or where he finds his information at all. So, you know, it's not a very scholarly book. I mean, it's just a bunch of pablum, but here's the deal. An abortionist writes a book about the moral case of abortion from a Christian point of view. And, and part of the book talks about how he justifies abortion from a Christian point of view or a religious point of view. And that's what I want to zero in on today. I want to take some time to deal with some of what he talks about in his book. Now, I'm not going to be able to get to all of his uh, religious arguments. We don't have the time, but I'm going to pick three of them, and we're going to discuss them here on the show today. Uh, those arguments deal uh, generally with Scripture, but also just a general case that he makes. And here are the three that I'm going to deal with. The first is this. He says that abortion, the word abortion, is not in the Bible. Okay, that's number one. Number two, he uses the Good Samaritan parable to defend his uh, behavior, his, his activism, or in this case, him killing children. Uh, he uses it to defend his views, uh, and that's the Good Samaritan passage. And then thirdly, and hopefully we'll get to this one, uh, he uses the passage out of Exodus, Exodus 21, verses 22 for 23, talking about when two men struggle and it causes a miscarriage in a woman and what the penalties are for that. He uses that to say that uh, ab abortion is morally justified based on that passage in Exodus. And we're going to talk about that one as well. So we're going to go through all three of these today on the show. And we're also going to play a clip by Mr. Willie Parker. I don't want to call him a doctor. He's not. He's not a doctor. He's an abortionist. And, and this guy is uh, kind of slick. Uh, honestly, he, he reminds me physically in the way that he speaks like T.D. T. D. Jakes. If you look at him, he looks like T.D. Jakes almost. Uh, you know, he's got the salt and pepper beard, a little, little bit overweight. You know, he's got the shaved head, bald head and all. Um, I'm not saying that there is a parallel between the two men, but he kind of does resemble T.D. Jakes in a sense. And he's articulate, and folks are taking him seriously. And it's important that we as Christians understand the arguments that are coming from guys like Willie Parker that justify killing babies based on Scripture, believe it or not. Uh, this guy's getting a platform across the country. Obviously, he's written this book. People are going to read this book. And some people are going to be persuaded that there's a, a, a case biblically for murdering babies. And so we've got to deal with that. We've got to be able to respond to it. These arguments come up in conversation on college campuses. Uh, they come up in conversations with our peers and friends within and without the church. And therefore, we've got to be able to make a case against them. Uh, we know Mil Willie Parker a little bit because our justice writers, that is our group of young people, several years ago, made the trip down to Jackson, Mississippi to uh, be in front of his abortion mill there, the one that he kills children in. And that's in Jackson, Mississippi, and it's called the Pink House. It's called the Pink House. If you show that clip, it's uh, our justice writers were in front of the Pink House for a full day um, showing the truth about abortion with these uh, victim imagery uh, on the streets. It was an interesting day, I'll tell you this, because not only because of the uh, clinic, so-called clinic escorts that were out there, but the city of Jackson, the police actually came out in force, and we had a uh, owner of a business nearby that actually stole our signs right in front of them, right underneath their nose. They watched it happen and didn't intervene. That video, by the way, is on our YouTube page if you want to watch it where they just, this, this owner of one of the businesses across the street just came out one by one, systematically removed our signs, and the Jackson, Mississippi police stood by and let it happen. Uh, it's unbelievable. By the way, you know, Jackson, Mississippi has a, uh, obviously a very uh, strong historical background uh, in civil rights. And so that's why we went there. We, we went there as part of a justice ride and we followed the, the path 
of the 1961 Freedom Riders. That's why we were actually in Jackson, Mississippi. But that's the Pink House, the notorious Pink House in Jackson, Mississippi, which, by the way, is the only abortion mill left in that state. There's only one left. This is it in Jackson, Mississippi. And this is where Willie Parker does his dirty work, uh, the, where he kills babies. So that gives us a little bit of a context for what we're going to be talking about today. So let, let's go ahead and dig into these, these arguments here for a moment. The first thing that Willie Parker talks about in this book entitled Life's Work, A Moral Case for Choice. By the way, a play on words, right? He's saying a life's work, life's work, like life of the preborn. I don't know if he's doing that to kind of poke us in the eye or not. I don't know. But by entitling in that, uh, it's kind of a slap in the face of pro-lifers, I think, across the country. Life's work, a moral case for abortion. He says that Abortion is not mentioned in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. The words don't appear in the Bible. Uh, you know, that's true. You know, it doesn't. Uh, by the way, this is the case that Bill Clinton made in the 1990s. He used to say over and over again that the Bible does not mention abortion. Uh, well, if you know logical fallacies, that's a fallacy uh, or a, a, a fallacy of silence. It's making an argument from silence. The fact that the Bible doesn't mention abortion doesn't mean that the Bible condones abortion. And that's what Willie Parker says. He says, that, well, because it's not mentioned, then God must be okay with it. That's called an argument from silence. It's a fallacy, a logical fallacy. And he tries to say that that would be an argument uh, for abortion. And it doesn't mean that it condones it. Now, the Bible's not silent about abortion. Abortion is a contemporary word that we use, right? It's, it's, it's the word that uh, was given to this so-called procedure a long time ago. But abortion is child killing. Abortion is child sacrifice. Abortion is murder. I mean, you can call it by a number of different uh, uh, titles or names, if you like. Uh, so the fact that the word abortion doesn't uh, come into the scripture, isn't mentioned, doesn't appear there, isn't is beyond the point it has nothing to do with it the question for me is does child killing uh get a mention in the bible and it does over and over again child sacrifice we talked about this last week uh the fact that they uh in the old testament that uh they were sacrificing their children to molech and they were passing them through the fire and it says in the bible there in jeremiah 19 verse 5 that God, it, it never even came into his mind that we would do such a thing, such a thing as child sacrifice. So child sacrifice is mentioned. Killing children is mentioned, born children. Uh, Jesus had a high regard for children. He said, let them come unto me. So there's all kinds of discussions in the Bible about children, the value of children. And let us not forget, that in, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, that the Bible says, thou shall not murder. Thou shall not murder. So when Willie Parker, abortionist, who claims to be a Christian, says that the Bible doesn't mention abortion, or, or, or the Bible doesn't mention abortion, well, I would direct him to t Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, that says, thou shall not murder, or better said, Thou shall not shed innocent blood. I mean, that's the verse that condemns abortion. And here's how. Uh, all we have to be able to prove is this. Are the preborn human? Are the preborn human? Are they made in the image of God or not? And if they're preborn are human, if we can prove that scientifically, biologically, then every verse in the Bible that refers to child killing or murder, Child sacrifice also applies to the preborn. If you can prove that they're human, that they are made in the image of God from conception, then these passages apply. And thou shalt not murder applies. So that's all you have to be able to do. And we can clearly do that. Throughout scripture, there's mention of how uh, the, uh, the child is formed in the womb. And Jeremiah talks about that. Uh, and, and, you know, other passages 
and so forth. So the idea that the uh, abortion is not mentioned in the Bible is beside the point. The word isn't mentioned, but child killing is, child sacrifice is, God condemns that. And he also says, thou shall not murder, or thou shall not shed it into blood. So if we just prove that uh, abortion kills a baby, then we can clearly state uncategorically that abortion uh, that that uh, God condemns abortion. So that's the first point I want to make, that the idea that abortion is not mentioned in the Bible is beside the point. The word may not be mentioned, but the concept is child sacrifice is and child killing is. All right, the second thing was, he makes a big deal about this in the book, uh, and that is the, the Good Samaritan passage. He uses it to justify him getting involved, what he calls abortion care, abortion care. By the way, how do you put those two words together? Abortion, which is the dismembering of babies and care. I mean, the two don't mix together, they don't match. But it, but this is what abortion advocates do. They use the term abortion care. And by the way, they hardly ever use the word abortion. They won't use the A word very often. What they'll call it is reproductive health care or this kind of thing. But he calls it, abortion care and he talks about in the book how the uh the speech by dr martin luther king jr the night before he was assassinated in memphis tennessee uh he talks about how that uh that that uh speech led to him deciding to kill babies now so what i'd like to do it's in the book but what i'd like to do is we have a clip of willie parker abortionist speaking to a group of abortion advocates where he talks about the speech of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and how the Good Samaritan, that, that talk about that, led him to decide to begin to kill children uh, as an occupation. Go ahead and play that clip. The man who used to preach down in the street, Dr. Martin Luther King, asked the question, or at least said, what made the Good Samaritan good? And you know the story of the Good Samaritan. There was a guy who had been robbed and people in his community were passing him by. And uh, uh, the Samaritans saw this person who had been injured. And while the other people passed this man by and said, what'll happen to me for stopping to help this person? Dr. King said what made the Good Samaritan good was that he reversed the question of concern. And instead of asking, what'll happen to me for helping this person? He asked, what'll happen to this person if I don't stop to help him? And I'm glad that there are people here today who are asking the question, what will happen to women if we don't make abortion services available to them? Right. What will happen to women and girls if we don't provide medically accurate sex education? What will happen if we let people deny very important care because their particular religious understanding tells them that it's not right to provide health care to people? My religious understanding tells me that it's always right to do right. It's always right to have compassion for people in their hour of need. So because Dr. King asked that question, I felt empowered to provide this care. I became more concerned about what happens to women when these services are available. And more recently, I became concerned about what happens to women in Alabama when these services are not available. And that's why I moved home. There you go. Well, boy, there's a lot there, isn't there? Um, Willie Parker says his religious experience, because of the because of the speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. referring to the Good Samaritan led him to kill babies. I, I have to believe if Dr. King knew that, he'd be rolling over in his grave right now. I mean, I don't believe that had, uh, <laughs> he would have hoped or ever wished that, that someone would interpret his view of the Good Samaritan passage in that way to justify the wholesale slaughter, dismembering, decapitation, and disemboweling of young children in the womb. I, I just can't imagine that. But, um, Anyway, I mean, he actually does a fairly good job of summarizing what Dr. King said. The problem is Willie Parker sees the women as the victim and not the baby. He doesn't talk about the baby at all. Obviously, he doesn't think babies are human or deserve the rights of personhood. So he says that the victims are women. Now, I don't know about you, but the victims are not women. At least most of them aren't. Some women are victimized by abortion. Some women are coerced by their boyfriends or their husbands or other family members or others. Certainly, uh, we know that. We, when we go to sidewalk council, 
at the abortion centers, we see it all the time. We see women going in there who really don't want to go in, who may be forced or coerced by someone to do this. We understand in that case, to a degree, they're victims, but they're not the primary victim. Certainly not in uh, all the cases, if not very, uh, very many at all. So what he does is he interprets the Good Samaritan passage to uh, include as the victim women. And I don't think you can do that. I mean, there may be in some cases women are victims, but not very often. So what I want to do is I'm going to read this passage. All right. This is found in Luke chapter uh, 10. Starts in verse 25. And so I'm going to read the whole thing. And then I'm going to kind of give you uh, what I believe we can glean out of it for our current situation here in America and across the world when it comes to child killing. So let's start, start in verse 25. Okay. It says this, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test. He's talking about Jesus saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Here's the quintessential evangelical question being put to Jesus. And Jesus said this, what is written in the law? How does it read to you? He asked the lawyer. And the lawyer answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Do this and you will live. Uh, and then the lawyer said, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? So let's just stop right there. So you have this lawyer. Of course, it's not like a lawyer like you and I know today. This is a, a teacher of the law, an Old Testament scholar, if you will, coming to challenge Jesus, asking, uh, what do you have to do to, inter uh, to, uh, to have eternal life? The quintessential question, right, that we would all ho hope that people would ask us. Uh, I wonder how might we ask, answer that question? I mean, if someone came up and asked me, how do I inherit eternal life? We'd answer that a lot differently, some of us. Some of us would immediately give them the sinner's prayer. Others would explain the gospel, et cetera, et cetera. Bottom line is, that's the question we want people to ask us, right? Jesus answered it very differently. He basically said, there are two things you got to do. First is, love God. Love God, and then love your neighbor. He basically gave them two commandments. He summarized the Ten Commandments into two. He said, the first uh, five are to love God and the next four, or I'm sorry, five are into, are to love your neighbor. And so he summarized the 10 commandments. He wasn't giving them two more. He wasn't saying there are now 12. There were 10. Now there are 12. Add these two. No, he summarized the 10 commandments. He summarized the old Testament law and the prophets by saying, love God and love your neighbor. And then once he summarized them, then he went into this, uh, this, this parable about the Good Samaritan, to clarify to this lawyer uh, to the understanding of who was his neighbor, who was his neighbor, because that's what he asked. So let's go ahead and read on, starting in verse 30. He asked, who was his, who's, the, who's my neighbor? And Jesus answered that by giving a parable. And he said, a certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a certain priest was going down on the road. And when he saw him, when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite also, when he came to that place, saw him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his, uh, put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the same day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robber's hands? And he said, and this is the lawyer, and he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. And Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Go and do the same. So this is the Good Samaritan parable. 
Far from Willie Parker thinking it's about women uh, being victimized in a contemporary setting, we can apply this to the pre-born. Because here's the thing. You have the, the, this, this person, this beggar, who ends up in a ditch. And there's the analogy to our contemporary victim of the pre-born, who are thrown into ditches, thrown into dumpsters, thrown into landfills, chopped up and, and uh, you know, washed down a sink. They are our contemporary beating victim that would be uh, within the, uh, I think, the understanding of the Good Samaritan passage. In fact, I think when Jesus told this story, of course, he's omniscient, he knows everything. I think he thought to himself, you know, this is going to have future uh, implications. It's going to have fu future application for people 2,000 years uh, in the future when we butcher children across the world. Because this passage clearly speaks to the role of, of Christians to defend the preborn. Let me unpack it for a second here. There's five basic keys in this passage to how we reverse the curse of abortion killing in America. There's five keys to how we end the shedding of innocent blood. It's all laid out here in this passage of the Good Samaritan. Let's, let's go take a look at this. Uh, First of all, remember, they, they all saw him, the Samaritan, right, the priest, and the, uh, the Levite. They all saw the beating victim. And this has a parallel today. We have to see the victim of abortion. We have to see them. Uh, without seeing them, we really don't understand. Dr. King said that injustice must be seen to be understood. The same is true today as it was back in these days. The fact is that all three of these individuals saw the beating victim in the ditch, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan. But it was the Samaritan, he's the only one that, that did something about it. He's the only one that felt pity and did something about it. He's the one who showed pity. The others, you know, probably were busy doing other religious things, but the Samaritan chose to change the way he behaved that day because of what he saw. Now let's look at the five keys. And this is what the Samaritan did. There's five things he did that we can glean out of this passage that we as Christians should be doing as it relates to the Holocaust of abortion that's, that's ravaging our land. The first is found in verse 33. And it says this, a certain Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him. And when he saw him, he felt compassion for him. Right there, he felt compassion. The first thing that has to happen for us to end the killing of preborn babies is that we've got to feel something. Something's got to go on right here in our hearts. We've got to feel compassion. Something emotional has to happen to us. When we see that preborn baby that's been killed by abortion, when we see a video of a, of a child that's been victimized by abortion, something should happen inside. If it doesn't, then you don't have a functioning conscience. If it doesn't, then nothing's going to happen beyond that because you don't care. So the first thing is that the Samaritan felt compassion for the beating victim. He had a functioning conscience that was pricked that day when he saw the beating victim. And then this number two, the second key is in verse 34. And it says, he, and he came to him. He came to him. In other words, he changed his direction that day. I'm sure the Samaritan had things to do, just like the priest and Levite. They had a busy day ahead of him. But instead of continuing on the road with his day, he changed his direction. He saw the beating victim. He said, no, this is going to alter my day at least. I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to change my direction, and I'm going to uh, deal with what I've just seen. In other words, he allowed the injustice of the beating victim to interrupt his life. We need to do that as Christians. The fact that babies are being murdered uh, at the numbers they are today, and the fact that a Willie Parker, an abortionist, claims to be a Christian uh, in our day, and he writes a book about it, ought to interrupt our lives. We should not be living normal lives because of what's happening in America. It's just like if you were living in, in Germany during the days of occupied Europe by the Nazis, would your life be the same? Would you just go about business as usual? No, you wouldn't. And the same should be true here in America. So 
The second thing that the Samaritan did is they changed his direct and direction and he came to him. The third thing it says in verse 34, again, that after he came to him, he bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. So what he did is he bandaged up his wounds. In other words, he served the beating victim. He took care of him. He ministered to him. Uh, and I'm certain that he had to get down into the ditch. He probably had to get all muddy and dirty and, and all, you know, it probably ruined every, all what he was wearing or whatever. But he didn't care about that. He bandaged up his wounds and he took care of him. That's number three. So he took care of him. And number four in thir verse 34, it says, after he bandaged up his wounds and poured oil and wine on him, it says that he put him on his own beast. He put, his, put him on his own beast. He took ownership. So number four is that he took ownership. The Samaritan took ownership over what he had just seen. He put him on his own beast. He shared that beating victim's burden. The Bible says that in order to fulfill the law of Christ, we must share one another's burdens, that we take them upon ourselves. In this case, the Samaritan didn't just continue on his way. He came to him. He ministered to him, right? And then he shared in his burdens. He shared in his sufferings. And, and that, that's number four, that he took ownership and shared in his sufferings. And then number five, the fifth point that I'm trying to make, or fifth key to reversing the curse of abortion killing in America, was that after he put him on his own beast, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. That was number number five. So uh, he he took care of him. He took ownership of him. And then number six, did I say six? Okay, five, sorry. The last point is this, in verse 35. Let me read that. And on the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more I spend, when I return, I will repay you. When I return, I will repay you. So this was one just a one-time deal. It just it wasn't a one-day deal. It wasn't, you know, that one moment that he walked by, changed his direction, ministered to the beating victim, put him on his own beast, and then forgot about it and didn't do anything after that. No. It says that he, when he returned, he said he would repay the innkeeper. So he stayed involved long term. He said, this has altered my life, not just my day. This has altered my life forever. And from here forward, I'm going to live differently. I'm going to be involved. I'm going to take care of him. And when I return, I'm going to repay you. So he stayed involved. So here are the five keys in this passage, again, that the Good Samaritan felt compassion, and so we need to feel compassion for the preborn. The Good Samaritan changed his direction when he said it came to him. He didn't continue on the road. Number three, that he served him because he bandaged him and took, up, uh, took care of him and ministered to him. Number four, he took ownership over the situation because he put him on his own beast, he shared his own, he shared his burden. And number five, he stayed involved long term. He made a long term commitment, and it says that he repaid him. And I want to add this: there was a financial component. He gave money. He repaid the innkeeper. So those are the five keys that come out of this passage in the Good Samaritan. Far from what M Willie Parker interpreted it to be, far from what he took Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s to me, uh, words to me when he talked about the Good Samaritan. Uh, Willie Parker talks about the victim being women. Uh, the women aren't the victims, folks. I mean, the, the, the victims in abortion are the babies, need I say. But this is what passes for the religious left. Uh, Willie Parker, who claims to be a Christian who he's not, uh, who uses scripture to defend baby killing. We find it happening all the time. So that was that was the second argument that we found in this book by Willie Parker. Uh, that is that he used the Good Samaritan and specifically the explanation of the Good Samaritan by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to justify him killing babies uh, using the Bible. 
The third is this, and this will be the final one that we're going to talk about today when it comes to Willie Parker's book entitled Life's Work, A Moral Case for Abortion. Uh, this abortionist who wrote a book about it, I mean, it's unbelievable, and defended it scripturally, is the verse in uh, Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, and if we can, we can turn there now. And this is a passage that talks about some of the, uh, uh, I guess, the penalties uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a chapter that talks about a lot of penalties. One is what happens when two men struggle together and there's a pregnant woman and and what are the penalties for that so a lot of here's the thing a lot of a lot of uh supporters of abortion i guess the way i could put it use this passage to justify killing children i don't know how many times i have stood in front of an abortion mill and heard a woman use this verse to defend her going in to kill her child Use this verse to say that God's God does not care about the preborn because the penalty for the baby dying in this passage were, is not as severe as the penalty if it were uh, for a woman who had died. So let's go ahead and read this verse. It's so totally misinterpreted by pro-abortion advocate, advocates. They use it all the time. Doctor Par this Willie Parker used it too. So let's go ahead and read this passage. Chart it starting in verse 21. So it's, it's Exodus 21, verse 21, uh, and it says this. If our, okay, no, it's in verse 22. Let's start there. And if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she, and my, my, my Bible says has a miscarriage. Okay, now keep that in, in mind, has a miscarriage. Uh, it's interpreted differently in different, I mean, it's, it's spelled out differently in other passages. In the one that you're looking at, it says that she gives birth prematurely, which is actually the correct way of interpreting it. But anyway, let's move on. If a man, if, if men struggle with each other and strike a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet there is no further injury, he shall surely be fined as the woman's husband may demand of him and he shall pay as the judges decide. So here's what Willie Parker will say. Willie Parker and other abortion advocates who want to use this verse will say, well, you know, it, it's not, it, it's a miscarriage. The baby dies, and instead of a, a eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, uh, that kind of thing, penalty, life for life, that the Bible prescribes or God prescribes that they only pay a fine if the baby dies which is a misinterpretation of the passage because many of them are interpreted to say that she has a miscarriage, but that's incorrect. It's incorrect. It says that if a man struggles with each other and strike a woman and a child so that she gives birth prematurely, there's nothing in that passage that says that the baby dies at all. And so the baby does not die, and that's why there's only a fine. It's only a fine. And we know this because if you read on in verse 23, but if there's any further injury, in other words, if the baby dies, if there's any further injury, then you shall appoint as a penalty life for life. And there it is. So if there's further injury for the child, in other words, the baby dies, then you shall appoint a penalty life for life. So the Bible here, God is prescribing that that baby were to die, he is saying the penalty is capital punishment, is the death penalty, life for life. So again, this is a total miscarriage of the passage that Willie Parker and others use. We've seen this all the time. People use this verse. It's, not in, it's interpreted in, incorrectly as a miscarriage. It should be that the, the woman gives a birth prematurely and the baby does not die. And if the baby does die, it's life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, right? And that's the way we need to see it. So if you ever hear anybody use this verse, just go straight to that, that it's not talking about miscarriage. It's not talking about the baby dying. And therefore, that's why there's only a fine. But if the baby does die, in other words, there's further injury, 
then it's life for life, tooth for tooth. The penalty is capital punishment. So anyway, that's one of the three things that I wanted to talk about here in this book that Willie Parker uses. He uses that Exodus chapter 21 verses 22 for 23 to justify his abortion killing practice. He uses the Good Samaritan passage to uh, give him license to kill children and supposedly defend victims, which are women in his opinion. And he uses the argument that abortion is not mentioned in the Bible. None of these are, are, uh, are, are ones that can be used, I think, as a Christian. And the bottom line is this, Willie Parker's not a Christian. Willie Parker is using religion to justify killing babies uh, maybe to salve his own conscience, but also just to make the case that abortion supporters across the country can be religious and defend the killing of unborn baby. This man is a dangerous man, uh, and there are others around that are writing stuff like this that are dangerous. We need to be aware of it and be sure that we are coming against it using the Word of God. We'll see you next time here on Facebook and other media platforms on The Mark Harrington Show. God bless you, God bless America, and remember America to bless You've God. You've been listening to Mark Harrington, your radio activist. For more information on how to become a witness against the evil, evil plague in America, call Created Equal at 614-269-7808, 614-269-7808. Or go online to createdequal.net. Createdequal.net. Be sure to tune to The Mark Harrington Show next time for your marching orders in the culture war.